average, you can estimate the coefficient, that is the relative impact of racism, uh, and how it varies in every little zip code in the entire US. So, and again, what this does is get us down, it drills down to the local scene in ways that, you, that, that, that provide a methodology for implementing the kind of perspective which um, I'm suggesting is useful, not to refute, not to replace, but to add to the other kinds of models of migration which you have seen in this conference. I'll stop there and let's discuss. This is the classic chicken and egg problem, that, that it, and, the, and the answer is it's both chicken and egg. And if we, if we try to look at it in the case of, of arts jobs, we, we are finding that, it's, that the arts jobs are more important in more recent years. If we go back 10, the classic way to try to answer it is, is look at data over time and what changes the patterns more over time and which comes first. And we're finding, if you go back to the 80s and early 90s, that the arts jobs a, have a much lower impact. So that, that suggests that, that the, the pattern you're describing is partly the case, that arts jobs are in part a luxury, you can say, but within the context of the, of the, of, of, uh, the US society after 2000 and so forth, they, they are attracting. The, 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 what, what's, what's, the, what's the positive dynamic? The positive dynamic is, is that they are an indicator of an amenity that is there, not only are they tolerant, a little bit bohemian, but they're creating more public art. They're doing things in a more aesthetically interesting way. They're sensitive to, uh, to architecture, to having nicer grass, to having a variety of things. And, and not even if, I mean, even if you only have less than 1% of the population who are artists, having, you know, having the difference between zero and 1% is massive in terms of, in terms of uh, the potential impact. Chicago also, by the way, has uh, the Art Institute School and Columbia College, and the combination of those and a few others mean that there are more arts graduates in Chicago than any other city in the U.S. And many of them move away, but at the beginning, a fair number of them stay on. So we've got a lot more artistic sensitivity here, as well as if you look at other places, say like Vancouver. Vancouver is massive in its concentration of artists. Vancouver is a beautiful city, in part because the artists have, have, been, have been sensitive. Okay. So, yes, yeah, right. Um, uh, it, how does gentrification link with scenes? We're, we're trying to model that now. That our general idea is that at the, that the, at the beginning of a gentrifying process, you may have mainly economic variables working. That is, I, in the very first slide I showed, uh, talented people move to where the rent is low. So low rent may be the first critical driver for, for gentrification. So think of that as, a, as, as in the Wicker Park, there's a case study of, by Rich Lloyd, a book called Neo-Bohemia, and it was, it was basically a low-income, poor neighborhood, and artists and musicians could move there in the 70s, I guess this was, 70s and 80s, and they started doing so. However, after, the, and when they, initially, they just moved there as individuals. They didn't think it was not an artistic neighborhood, but then a few of them began to get together in a cafe. And that, in turn, led to its sort of labeling as, a, as an artistic neighborhood, and then it became the leading art, artist neighborhood in Chicago. Okay, ten, five, ten years after that, young stockbrokers, lawyers, and others who were a little more bohemian in lifestyle said, I'd like to live in, Lincoln, in, in Wicker Park, the artist neighborhood, not in Lincoln Park, which is the square neighborhood. So, so the, the, uh, uh, they moved in and they priced out the artists. So classic gentrification in this sense. Soho in New York, uh, places in San Francisco. So the story I'm telling suggests 
that the, art, that the amenities of Bohemia are critical not at the first stage, but at sort of a second stage. And they may have initially, I mean, the, the artists may have created it, but then they, they were, once they had created it and it became the artistic neighborhood, that in turn drove, that, is, that in turn attracted people whose job may not have labeled them as, as, as Bohemian, but they, they still had that, they had, they had that taste. They moved there, but now it's getting less and less Bohemian. It's getting more and more gentrified, so-called, so in the sense of being less Bohemian. So I, I, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that there's a combination of these traditional factors like low rent and, my, and, and, and movement and based, 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 on, based on income and, and occupation, but that in a, in an, at an initial stage in this, in, this ex, in, in this example, not always, uh, gentrification may be heightened by the scene characteristic in this example of, of, of Bohemia. Or people can talk about yuppies, or, there, or it may be surfing, in, in, in the case of Sally's uh, veggie burger in San Diego. So, it, 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 so I'm suggesting not throwing out any variables, but looking at how they, they combine, and, that, and that, that I think this is a, a, good, a, a good example of how, of, how they, of how they seem to. We have, a, we have a, an MA in progress on this. Yes? Uh, I think... Let me think if our measure of um, yeah i mean if we if we measure if we measure say the change in non white population, even if they had one non white in Lake Wobegon twenty years ago and they have three now, that would be a three hundred percent increase so uh, in that sense, it would, it would still get a score and we could analyze the increase and if, and if the, the, uh, the late night series of the detective and others uh, have a little bit of uh, uh, NPR appeal with saying, hey, this is, this is an interesting place, I'd like to move to Lake Wobegon, maybe, maybe that in fact is, is, is working, maybe tolerance is attracting those two other those, those two other uh, non-whites. So um, uh, I think the, I, 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 I think Lake Wobegon ought to fit, ought to be able to be fitted to this map in ways that don't necessarily contradict it. it but even though it illustrates your point that, that, that some places have very low non, non, non so the, whole, the, the whole Northwest is the same way. Seattle, Portland, Oregon, and so forth. They're, they're the same kind of, they're the same kind of thing. Yeah. Let me, well, if, take, take Seattle. I mean, Lake Wobegon is a little bit fanciful, but if we take Seattle, Seattle elected an African-American mayor. Okay, what are the, and this is something I've, I've worked on a lot. I mean, why, why are African-American mayors elected? All right, and I'm suggesting that the dynamic of election in, in, of Harold Washington, Chicago, is drastically different from Seattle. In, Seattle, in Chicago, roughly 80% of African Americans voted for, for Harold Washington. Most whites voted against Harold Washington. It was a you know, classic black versus white kind of racial, racial confrontation. In Seattle, you had 5-7% you know, you know, African American, something like that. But what, the, what that says is that 90% you know, of, 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 uh, of whites in Seattle, or a large proportion of whites, we're willing to say yes. Let's have an African American mayor, and um, and maybe like the maybe the Portland Oregon's and the Lake Wobegon's are more like Seattle in the sense that there there may be there may be minimal racism, and in fact, an effort not to show that we are not racist by voting for an, an African American mayor in a in a way that makes a, a general a general political statement. Now, you can say would that change if you if the population increased? Maybe so, but but that that's that's, that's a different issue. Is that, is that a reasonable answer? Okay. Yes. Yeah, this, this, the, this is not meant to be, the, I, I, I added this this morning, I'll, I'll be frank. I said I want to show you something which just shows the methodology, but this, this is not to be taken literally in, in detail. I just want to sort of show you that the, these are, these are the, the coefficients of, of how important a, a particular variable is. But that, that I, 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 I'm not even sure what it is, frankly. Okay. <laughs> I was early this morning. <laughs> okay. Yes. I sit on the uh, advisory committee on economic development of CMAP, 
and I've argued with them they should pay more attention to amenities and they say, oh, what for? So there, there are a lot of traditional uh, <laughs> people around, around the city who, who don't pay attention to that. On the other hand, Mayor Daley had a little battle with the governor and the federal government who was saying, uh, we want to have an airport out on the, in the middle of downtown Chicago. And so after midnight one night, the mayor sent in some bulldozers and they put X's across the, the runways. And that, that's, uh, that, that was the, the, the classic. And so what is it now? A nature park. So we have more parks in Chicago, in part because of mayoral initiative and the bulldozers uh, in ways that, that and, and, and the mayor is proud of having planted more than one million trees. So that is, it's not just parks, it's, it's greenery, it's sensitivity to, to, uh, to that kind of aesthetic, which is a drastic change in the city. This city, this city when I first came to Chicago, we used to turn on our, turn our wind, windshield wipers every morning because there was so much uh, soot that had deposited from the steel mills to the south the night before. Yeah. But I guess I, I just caution you have to be careful that is it may be the decisions about things like green spaces in part are related to the Burnham plan in the late 19th century of reserving for instance that whole area up the lakefront with the with the, uh, the, uh, the the bicycle paths and so forth which is the number one amenity of Chicago and in fact, the most, and has the, if, you, if you take Navy Pier and uh, I think the, uh, the aquarium areas, these are the most visited parks in the United States, seven times the Grand Canyon. So we got massive amount, this is a massive attraction, and it's in part the Burnham Plan, which has reserved a, you know, a massive amount of space, plus some of the old boulevards, which go back to 19th century decisions. Now, many of these got run down, the parks were not used, they were filled with crime. It was very difficult in, let's say, 50s, 60s, 70s. In the last 20 years, this has been transformed again. And so the parks have become very active, very participatory. There are many more programs. Lots of kids are going there. So they are used, and they have become a vigorous part of the city. But I guess I'm just saying we need to, we need to capture the park as a, the, the seen aspects of the park and not just measure it in terms of, of square space, or square, square footage or something. Yes. That number is an amazing statistic, seven times more than Grand Canyon. Does that take into account the fact that people go to Grand Canyon like just go once, whereas people in Chicago might visit David Pierre multiple times? Yes. Yeah. Here? Yeah. No, this, 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 I think, includes uh, Sally, who decided she'd come back to Chicago and she'd, she'd go to, veg to Navy Pier every Friday night to get a, a, a veggie burger. So, uh, and, and probably there, there are fewer high end, uh, Japanese who want to, you know, want to get the grandeur of the Grand Canyon, they might not get in an airplane in Tokyo just to go to Navy Pier. <laughs>